I'm Sarah Kenzier, the author of the bestsellers The View from Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight, and of the upcoming book They Knew, How a Culture of Conspiracy Keeps America Complacent, available for pre-order now. I'm Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker, and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller Mr. Jones, about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine, a film the Kremlin doesn't want you to see, so be sure to see it. And this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the United States and rising autocracy around the world. Welcome to our special spring series, Gaslit Nation Presents Rising Up from the Ashes, Cassandra's and other experts on rebuilding democracy. Our bonus episodes, available to Patreon subscribers at the truth teller level and higher, feature our esteemed guests taking the Gaslit Nation self-care Q&A. So for fun ideas, sign up to hear that. Joining at this level also gives you access to hundreds of bonus episodes on topics in the news today. We'll be back with our regular episodes in July. If you're signed up anytime between now and then at the Democracy Defender level or higher on Patreon, you'll get special access to watch a live taping of Gaslit Nation over the summer. More details to come. This interview was recorded on January 7th, 2022. Today, we're joined by Dr. Yanya Lalich, a researcher, author, and educator specializing in cults and extremist groups with a particular focus on charismatic relationships, political and other social movements, ideology and social control, and issues of gender and sexuality. Dr. Lalich is Professor Emerita of Sociology at California State University, Chico, where in 2007 she was awarded the Professional Achievement Honor. Uh, She is also the founder and director of the Center for Research on Influence and Control. She received a BA with honors from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has a master's in human development and a PhD in human and organizational systems from Fielding Graduate University in Santa Barbara, California. Her books include Take Back Your Life, Recovering from Cults and Abusive Relationships, Captive Hearts, Captive Minds, and Bounded Choice, True Believers in Charismatic Cults, based on her research on the Heaven's Gate cult, the group that committed collective suicide in 1997, and her own decades plus years of experience in a political cult, the San Francisco-based Democratic Workers' Party. Most importantly, her work puts forth um, her bounded choice theory, which offers a new approach for understanding the dynamics of self-sealed groups and the true believer phenomenon, Welcome to the show, Dr. Lalich. You are certainly in demand these days, we imagine, unfortunately. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me on your on your show. And yes, I'm busier than ever. <laughs> <laughs> so many cults, so little time was actually the name of a Gaslit Nation episode. Um, because what Sarah and I have been witnessing, like so many others, is a um, cult-like mentality with this deepening polarization in America, which is uh, made worse by an expanding consolidation of far-right propaganda networks and gerrymandering and dark money groups running amok and so forth. And that polarization leads to cults, uh, a cult-like mentality. We, we imagine that, that that what we're witnessing is cult-like. Right, that's how we describe it. Is would you say that's correct? It's in in the field of, of what what you've researched. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the kind of um, closed mindedness, and us versus them thinking is you know one of the hallmarks of of a cult or a cult mentality, and we're certainly seeing a lot of that today, along with the violence um, that was fostered by. Is it okay if I mention his name? Oh, yes. please do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think during the Trump years, um, a lot of hate and violence got drummed up uh, that was lying under the surface in our country. And so now we've got this combination of this us versus them mentality and this sort of license to act out. And so we see people you know, going into stores and causing a riot if they are asked to put a mask on and things like that. And it's just really become a nationwide phenomenon. 
It's normalized violence of all kinds. Like you mentioned the stores, all the viral videos of, of people throwing tantrums in stores over masks, having to wear masks. And we've also seen people uh, becoming increasingly violent on flights in America today. And, and this normalization of violence begins with hate speech, disinformation, propaganda, which says it's okay to lash out, it's okay to dehumanize others. We saw it with our own eyes how one of the earliest in- instances was Trump um, mocking a reporter who was, you know, had a disability and he mocked him, mocked how he spoke his and his physical appearance. And everyone, you know, a lot of normal so-called people who have any common sense might look at that and go, wow, that's shocking. His campaign should be done. But instead, it just unleashed, as you said, this validation, this permission to uh, dehumanize others. And it's somewhat different from, uh, you know, the cults that I've been studying over the 35 years, because what what we've been used to is, you know, what what I now call the the run of the mill cults or the brick and mortar cults where, you know, there was a headquarters, you knew who the leader was, you knew where the various centers were, things like that. Well, there were also always groups that were more secretive and underground, but the kind of acting out towards society that we're seeing today is not typical of cults in the past. I mean, some cults, yes, did act out, like Om Shinrikyo, uh, the group that put the sarin gas in the Tokyo subway. Um, But in most cases, cults are far more insular. So this this acting out and these violent attacks and the hate speech and the, as you say, the, the permission to act in these completely obnoxious ways um, is really a, a new phenomenon in terms of cultic thinking. It's sort of like what you saw in the past, as you mentioned, the brick and mortar cults uh, is almost like the blockbuster video of cults. And now we've entered this age of streaming where it's, it's, it's just easily accessible. You could do it anywhere. And um and it's and it's it it it's just the convenience of it, essentially, essentially, and a decentralization in a lot of ways. Yes, and certainly the the year that we were sheltered in during the you know the first year of the pandemic, you know, gave people all that time to peck around on the internet. And you know, as we've learned, they were shunted around by these algorithms. I mean, I have no clue what an algorithm is, but apparently people who understand that uh, were able to suss out how people were you know, pushed into these, what we now call rabbit holes of extremism. And people felt, you know, in these internet communities, they felt the same kind of closeness and sense of purpose and camaraderie. As, as people do when they join a physical cult. So again, we have this online phenomenon which has taken over and is creating these new ways for, uh, for cultic groups to form and for people to take control and take advantage of other people. You're comparing the brick and mortar type cults, the more traditional, I guess, if you could say that cults of the past uh, to the new cults that have emerged in the era of digital media. Do you think that there was a particular year or a particular event or turning point that accelerated this? Or was it more of a gradual uh, phenomenon as more and more people got internet or smartphones or what have you? Well, I think it, you know, it evolved over time, just as everyone, just about everyone is, you know, using the internet for one thing or another. And, you know, the first really kind of internet based cult activity that we saw was the Heaven's Gate cult, you know, the one that committed suicide Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, mass murder, however you want to look at it. They believed, they believed a comet was, was the, a comet was falling. Comet, right? Yeah. And they, they, they said, if you, if you kill yourselves with me, the, the charismatic leader said, if you kill yourself with me, we'll, we'll get a ride on the comet. Right. Although they didn't think they were killing themselves. I mean, they, as they said, you know, what we're doing isn't death. Death is staying here. What we're doing is life. And, you know, so it's another example of how cults turn around the language um, and create their own sort of worldviews. Um, so that was, you know, they they had a pretty big presence on the internet, but, you know, in the mid 90s, um, because some of their people who had jobs, you know, were computer programmers. And then since then, of course, it's just mushrooms. So there are quite a few traditional cults, if we want to call them that, who in some ways only have an online presence. Um, for example, the, the group called Twin Flames Universe 
almost everything they do is online. They rarely do any kind of physical gathering. Um, so that's become very common uh, for the regular old cults, as I call them. And then, of course, I think the real, you know, as I was saying earlier, I think the real turning point was the pandemic. And, and that's when people really got caught up in these um, awful groups. Um, certainly QAnon was around before that, but then it really mushroomed uh, with the pandemic. Wow. Um, I am so now fascinated by the Twin Flames universe that you mentioned, because I've come across this on social media, and I've actually read about it and thought, oh, that's interesting. I've never heard of Twin Flames. And I, I went down the rabbit hole one sleepless night on Twin Flames, and I didn't realize it was a cult until you just told me that. Oh, Twin Flames is absolutely horrendous and harmful. I mean, they because they target young women uh, and say, you know, we'll find your twin flame, you know, your life soul partner. Um, and because it's mostly women in the group, what they've done in recent years now is have people go through sex change so that one of them will become a, a man and take on masculine characteristics. So they begin with lots of, you know, hormones that they have some company who's willing to feed them hormones without proper psychological evaluations. And you see these couples um, where, you know, there's a, obviously a female, and then you see someone who has a beard and lots of hair growth, um, is dressed very kind of male and macho and and it's it's and these are people who never in their life dreamed of having a sex change so it's it's so exploitative and it's so harmful right so it's it's not like they naturally like they, they, they're not naturally trans like they it was like they're not somebody that's it okay it's, it's, it's entirely different from a, a natural born trans person versus exactly which i have no problem with right of course you know, this is coerced. It's absolutely coerced. And these young women are go along with it. Uh, they're completely trapped psychologically in this group. And um, and the leaders are considered sort of godlike persons. They, they recently had a public gathering in, I believe it was in Sedona. And when they came out, you know, everybody just cheered and treated them like gods. You know, it's a couple. I believe they're headquartered in Michigan somewhere. But no, it's a, it's a very harmful group. What struck me about it is that they were selling toxic romance, saying that if if the person you're in love with does all these abusive things to you, it's okay. They'll come back because you're meant to be together. And I, that's why I, I was on the rabbit hole with them. I'm like, what is this? And you saw all these comments saying, oh, this person that I'm madly in love with keeps ignoring me and wants nothing to do with me, but I believe in the twin flame and that he'll come back eventually. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> So I just thought it was just like a random Instagram group I stumbled on. And um, I did not realize how deep the web goes and how organized it is. And that, it's really creepy. Yeah. And of course, they charge money for the uh, courses that they do and, you know, whatever. And so, you know, there's also a financial aspect to it. Okay. So I just want to, I'm, I'm emphasizing this because me, you know, somebody that talks a lot about this information and the times we're in, I casually stumbled upon a very active and dangerous cult and just had no idea. It's just ubiquitous now. You could be on Instagram. I go on Instagram and look at photos of pretty dresses and fantasy vacation spots I'll never go to. Like that's like my self-care. And then next thing you know, probably because those are those are kind of girly if you want to put a gender on it, but and probably I got pumped some twin flame nonsense. And I started reading these weird comments and I got like I was like and I, I'm like, oh, twin flames a thing, okay, but I didn't realize. Thank goodness we have our guest on Andrea, so that you did yes. not uh, join the twin flames all accidentally. <laughs> this this turned out to for be me. an intervention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, because <laughs> um, I was thinking this whole time Sarah might be my twin flame, and that. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> man. Um, so you're you're a perfect example of how easy it is and how quickly exactly. it happens. Exactly right. Exactly. It's just casual. It was just a casual scrolling one night looking for some entertainment. And I just got roped into something that I had no understanding of. And so that's disturbing. And so obviously you've been in demand. We've seen interviews with you with Wired magazine because the social media 
plays such a big role in this. All the social media platforms. So you think they're safe. You think that they're they're escapist. But next thing you know, you could be radicalized or you could be sold something that is that is a gateway to more dangerous uh, initiation. Right. Could you talk you a little bit sold. about that? <laughs> yeah. Or you could be sold. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, it is Human Trafficking Awareness Month. So, um, and that's a, you know, a whole other area that very similar tactics and techniques are used to uh, seduce and coerce. Uh, men and women into that world of uh, sex trafficking or labor trafficking. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's right now it's, um, it's rampant. I mean, I, I, as you say, I'm, I'm busier than ever. I get, I get emails and messages from all over the world. I mean, last night I did an interview, uh, a live interview on a London radio program, which is one of the most widely heard. It was a call-in program. And already this morning, I've gotten a handful of emails from people who listen to that program who say, I, you know, I've had this cult experience or I grew up in this incredibly narcissistic family. And, you know, what can you do to help me? You know, so, boy, if I had a magic bullet, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So one of the questions we get a lot, a lot from our listeners is, you know, I we hear a lot from our listeners about how they have people in their family that are convinced of the big lie or convinced that um, Trump is the savior, it, it, and and they don't know how to get through to them, or they're convinced that um, the vaccine and masks are evil. This is so in my family, I have somebody that we've lost to the big lie. We're estranged from this person now. And then we have somebody that we are forced to be estranged from because he's convinced that that uh, he is he is the equivalent of an early freedom fighter against the Nazis, and that the Nazis of today are the are Dr. Fauci and others trying to force people to get the vaccine and the mask and all these mandates, and he refuses to to get a vaccine or wear a mask around us, and we and so we can't see him. We haven't seen him. Um, so it's it, so lives are being. Like families are being divided over this. Families are being separated over this. Um, and our listeners reach out to us all the time saying, what do I do with this situation? How do, how do I get through to them? How do I get my family back? And we don't know what to tell them. But the one advice that I've heard, that I've researched, and, and, and tell me what, what you often recommend to people is try not to isolate them. Because if you isolate them, they go further. They have remain have some safe stable contact with them so that you don't lose them entirely just give them some sort of window some out yes yeah that's a, that's absolutely my philosophy i mean i talk about using critical compassion you know that that even though sometimes people believe things that to us are completely you know horrendous like you know someone in your family becomes a white supremacist or something which is i guess far more hateful than an anti-vaxxer or QAnon or, but so it's hard to say, be nice to that person, but it is important. You don't have to like what they're believing in and you primarily don't want to talk with them about what they're believing in. What you want to do is try to maintain contact in some kind of way, like never cut them off. If they cut you off, okay, that's, they did that, but don't you ever cut them off. And I think it's important um, as what you were referring to, what I call a safe haven. Let them know that you're a safe haven. If they ever decide to change their mind, that your home is someplace where they can come and not be ridiculed and not be humiliated. And you're not going to say, see, I told you so. That was a stupid thing to join. you know. <laughs> but they're going to be able to come and just lay on the couch and chill out. And if they don't want to talk, they don't have to talk. Now, that's going to be their choice and their motion. And the only way you can perhaps encourage them to take that step is when and if you do have contact with them, rather than argue about beliefs and who's right and who's wrong, it's best to remind them of, of good times when you were a family or you were friends or whatever, you know, whatever the relationship was. So Remind them about times you went fishing together or last Christmas Eve when Uncle Joe played Santa Claus and it was so funny or, 
you know, those kinds of things that, that will kind of pull at their emotional heartstrings because you want to offer alternative to what they believe is now their new family. And you want to remind them that you were an okay family. You know, all families have problems and whatnot, but you also love them and you care for them. And look at all these times in the past when we did this, that, and the other. And that's, that's about the best advice I can give anybody. Wow. Okay. So if you've lost somebody down the rabbit hole, whatever it may be, you want to keep the vibe around them accessible, non-judgmental, and as en- as enjoyable as possible. Just sort of, you know, come, you can come here, decompress. You want to basically provide a safe space. Right. And if you're, you know, if you're able to get together with the person, you know, do do something fun, you know, do, do the things you used to do together. And if your relationship with the person is completely damaged, I mean, there's no way they'll even communicate with you. Well, then maybe there's someone else, you know, maybe there's a cousin that that person was always close to or a high school friend or whoever, you know, or an aunt they always admired and have that person be the contact person and keep yourself out of it for a while, because maybe you're, presence or your efforts only make them go in deeper, as you were saying earlier. So you need to be strategic about it. Right. As frustrating and as hurtful as it may be, it's not the time to fact check the person. Because I think that's, that's what's, I think that's a big part of the frustration is it's disinformation. It's brainwashing. It's, it's just, they're totally divorced from even the laws of physics. And so just, so, and and it can be jaw dropping some of the things they believe that come out of their mouths. And you're like, how <laughs> can you right. say that and think that? So if we are living in a disinformation age and fact checking is so important and fighting for the truth and just standing your truth is so important. Do you have any obligation or should you not try to lead someone to the truth? Should you just hold space for them and simply be? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. No, but any way that you try to discuss or argue with them is more than likely not going to work. And it's just going to have them dig in their heels. Um, So, you know, if if, when I was in my cult, if someone had come to me and said, oh, you know, let me tell you about Stalin or let me tell you about, you know, what the Communist Party has done in China and the mass starvations and this, that and the other. I had answers for all of that. You know, there was no way anybody was going to argue me out of that. Although if someone had come to me and said, are you happy? I would have had to think about that because I wasn't happy. Happy was not a word in our vocabulary. You weren't supposed to be happy. So that might start a different conversation that might get you to, you know, might've gotten me to think about, oh, wait a minute, you know, what, what exactly is the point of this? Is it to destroy me? <laughs> so, so it, it, as I say, you need to be very strategic, but in general, avoid ideological discussions in terms of happiness like the question are you happy and was the point of this is to destroy me but it does seem like the cult we've seen certainly the cult of trump is a self-destructive cult he incited his followers to break the law and provide all this evidence for law enforcement of themselves breaking the law and now hundreds are being arrested and prosecuted, and there's certainly going to be many more to come. And these people have faced uh, expensive lawyer bills for what they did on our Capitol in January 6th. And so it, it, Trump basically said to them at his January 6th rally and all the weeks leading up to it, like, self-sacrifice yourself for me. So there is this dynamic of, no, you're not supposed to be happy. You're supposed to destroy yourself for the cult leader. Um, could you talk about that human sacrifice and the dynamic behind it and why people fall into it? I believe I understand it as as the consequence of, of what I call a charismatic relationship with an authoritarian leader. People misunderstand the concept of charisma and they believe that it's something inherent in an individual, right? You're born with it or something. The charisma is actually a social relationship. Once you have determined that someone is charismatic and you grant them that title, then they have power over you. Because obviously, if you think someone is charismatic, you think they're special in some way. And so that becomes a relationship with an imbalance of power, right? So that starts right from the get-go. And then the more you 
believe that. And the more authoritarian the person is so that they are convincing you that they have all the answers and that you shouldn't challenge and you shouldn't question. You should just be 100% devoted to this person and follow everything they say. You know, your whole mindset starts to change about the world. Your worldview shifts. And within that, your sense of morality shifts so that you now take on the morality or the immorality of the leader. And that's why we see people doing things that are shocking to us, doing things that they never would have done in any other circumstance, right? So it's a, it's a combination of all of that, which is what I call the indoctrination program, right? Or a re-socialization of you as the committed person that lead people to just do these incomprehensible things to those of us on the outside. Right. It's a feeling that um, their lives are given meaning. And yes, it, oh, yeah. absolutely. They're given meaning. They have purpose. Uh, they think they're on the side of right. And you get to a point, and this is where my, my bounded choice theory comes in. You get to a point as a devoted member uh, or a devoted follower where you cannot imagine life outside of that group or that situation, right? There is no way that you can see any other way to live or be than being loyal to that person and following whatever is happening. And so then you're trapped in this kind of psychological trap, um, which I call bounded choice, where, yeah, you have choices to make about certain things, but they're not consequential. The most consequential is, should I stay or should I leave? And you're going to opt for the group because it's too scary and too dangerous and, and too unimaginable to leave. When it comes to Trump, um, can you comment on, I mean, at least what I see as the different cults that follow him? I mean, he obviously has a cult following, but I feel like I'm seeing different uh, phenomenon. Some of it is the typical sort of personality cult that you see emerging around an aspiring autocratic leader. I also have seen people who think that he's the Messiah and they're basically transferring religious beliefs onto him. Or alternatively, they think he's the Antichrist, but they think that's a good thing because it's heralding in um, an end times, you know, and then QAnon is sort of its uh, own entity into itself, combining aspects of the other two. Like, what do you see within Trump's followers and if they are to leave uh, their cult worship um, or belonging, like how would that come about? Well, I mean, that's why what we're seeing with Trump is something we've never seen before, because we're seeing this cult-like behavior on a national scale. And as you just described, we see it manifest itself in a variety of different ways. So it's not like there's just one solid block of people who are charging ahead with one belief system. We've got the whole mishmash of everything. Um, so he was, he was a very, if you want to even call him a cult leader, which I, I don't necessarily, because uh, I think he wasn't smart enough, but if you want to call him a cult leader, and he did do things that helped his fellowship grow, uh, the kinds of techniques of, you know, high arousal, the, ch the sh chanting, the shouting, the wearing the hat, MAGA hat, all of that. But you'll have people, you know, see him as some kind of hook to hang on to in whatever belief system they've chosen. And he does have these different personas depending on the group, like you said. For some, it's religious. For some, it's, you know, just thinking he's like the best politician or businessman or whatever. Um, and getting people out of that is, is just like anything else. I mean, you know, certainly we saw after the January 6th attempt last year, we did see a lot of people left QAnon and some of the groups because it was such a disaster. But then a lot of them at the same time got recruited by other groups who were waiting in the wings. So a lot of them were, were then recruited by the Proud Boys or this militia group or that. Um, because they sort of had lost their worldview, and so they were vulnerable at that point. Um, so that's why it's 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 so shifting, and it's so hard to get a handle on. But I don't know. I mean, leaving those groups, and there's so many different manifestations. I mean, some of it is going to have to happen through law enforcement taking action when when there is criminal behavior, criminal activity, and then some of it is just hoping people wake up one day and 
see that what they're believing in is, you know, is complete nonsense. You know, again, I, I don't really have answers for that. <laughs> well, one thing I'm wondering about is, you know, I've followed QAnon for a long time. And within the morass of propaganda and bullshit uh, that the QAnon acolytes would spew out, there were grains of truth. Like, for example, QAnon was following the Epstein-Maxwell case before Epstein, uh, you know, allegedly died in prison and before it sort of rose to prominence. And so the problem with the rest of the media not really covering that, and especially of law enforcement not cracking down on them, is that when they finally did, when it was all brought to the fore, the QAnon folks were like, aha, you know, you see, we were right all along. They buried it all along. They did all these things. And then they would use that as a way to say, well, therefore, all the other things we're saying is true. JFK Jr. has risen from the dead. Trump is the messiah. The, you know, the storm is coming, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it made me wonder, you know, if our government were to be very, very honest about institutional corruption and were to actually, uh, you know, hold criminal elites accountable for crimes that have been going on for decades, would that work to kind of deprogram, uh, you know, acolytes in these political cult movements? Or is it something, you know, beyond that, like an emotional attachment that doesn't respond uh, to action or logic? Well, it's probably a little of both. I mean, that's a big act, ask <laughs> to think that our government is going to cop to institutional <laughs> corruption. Oh, we know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I think we can't discount the, the emotional attachment that people have to these involvements. And a lot of these groups are the people who, you know, sort of take leadership. You know, they're very good at damage control. So, yeah, they can say... You know, even, you know, the example of Save the Children, right? They were talking about pedophilia. Well, who's not against pedophilia, right? So that's the cleverness of, of what they do. And then, you know, sort of glomming on to a legitimate organization and trying to align themselves with that and recruiting people who, who were decent, honest people, genuinely interested in fighting pedophilia, get caught up in this, this other shifty organization or movement. Uh, so it's difficult because law enforcement can only do stuff if there are crimes, right? I mean, that's why we have a hard time even getting them interested in in some of the more outrageous cult behavior that happens because they're like, oh, I don't know, you've got to really show me evidence of crimes. And then who do you get to do that? You know, former members are afraid. They don't want to go to court. You know, we know all that. It's like domestic violence. You know, we know what that's like. Uh, so law enforcement can only do so much. And trying to rationalize with them, you know, clearly hasn't worked because they're not thinking rationally. You know, they, they have that closed mindset that we talked about. Um, and you have these different, you don't even have one leader you can grab onto and discredit, you know, because you, one day you have this guy who pops up and, you know, some talk show host who then dies of COVID. And then the next day someone else pops up and that's who they follow. You know, I was saying to a friend the other day, Trump could die tomorrow and it wouldn't make a difference. It's way too widespread at this point. Do you think there's any comparable uh, politician that could you know, attract the kind of following that Trump did? And if so, who? Mm, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't really either. I'm just curious. I think the point is that it's decentralized. And a lot of the stars of today, we, they, they weren't on our radar back in 2016. Like um, the QAnon mascot out of Georgia, Marjorie. Oh, Marjorie Tyler Green. Yeah, Marjorie Tyler Green, Lauren Bobart. They weren't on our radar. And so my point is, is that Trump's movement is really good at radicalizing people and producing new stars. And it's it's that belonging. It's like, you're one of us. We've got our secret language, our coded language, which white supremacy, the KKK, all which were typically underground movements because they had to be because there's nobody above in the mainstream, embraced by the mainstream as Trump was, giving them permission to come out. So there used to be coded language, like the 14 words 
um, all this like Hitler Nazi symbolism that the American movement adopted, and and that's how they would talk to each other, and like the OK sign with their hand. Right. And now and it's Pepe the Frog. Remember Pepe? The oh Frog. yes, yes. And and now it's it's let's go, Brandon. And it's saluting flags that were at the at the uh, January six violent attempted coup attempt, and so they ha- it's a clubhouse. It's a massive, massive clubhouse, and it's this big belonging of a movement. And through that, that's how you get all this new talent to rise because it's, it's so massively decentralized. And I think that's the challenge we have before us is. What like Trump's in bad health? He's he's you know we we know his eating habits, right? The guy loves his McDonald's. Like he, he's not going to be around forever, and unfortunately, he's leaving behind what looks like a cult, walks like a cult, sounds like a cult, and that cult is going to breed all these other Trumpkins. And so I think what we need to do is 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 if you want to be rid of this public menace and this public health crisis, because it is a public health crisis, they're extending the pandemic. They keep the pandemic going because they refuse to get vaccinated and wear masks. And um, they're a danger to us. They're they're, They're a literal danger to us. So there has to be legislation that steps in and nips what empowers them. They're always gonna be among us in some shape or form, but you have to pull the plug on their mainstream voice and their mainstream normalization and their mainstream access. And so I think some ways to do that, and and tell us if you agree, is obviously regulate social media so it can't just casually rope people into the rabbit hole. Uh, Regulate media, like bringing back the fairness doctrine, uh, which was destroyed under, I believe it was Reagan, and apply it now to cable news and apply it, of course, to radio, where both sides of any controversial issue have to be addressed, combat consolidation of uh, media so there's no more monopolies in media of any kind. That's extraordinarily dangerous. Um, and just and also strengthen public schools, strengthen fact-based institutions, scientific institutions, and so forth. So wouldn't you agree that since we're stuck with Trump in some way, shape, or form, that we need to have laws step in, uh, laws need to be enacted in order to protect us from what gives rise to Trump and his movement? Yeah, I agree with you. I, you know, I think the problem is of that is, I mean, look what's happening right now in the government with, you know, the Congress and the Senate and these, you know, fake Democrats. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And about social media, about education. I mean, I've, I've been saying all, all along, part of this is the, the effect of the dumbing down of America that we've witnessed over the last, what, 30, 40 years. Um, the education system is not at all what it used to be. I mean, I went to a really crappy high school and I came out with a really good education. You know, it was a working class high school and I did fine. I got myself to college. I graduated with honors as a professor when I was teaching before I retired. I mean, I'd have these students who would come out of nice middle class families who lived in nice middle class suburbs and sometimes went to private schools and and they couldn't write a sentence, you know, and it was just like shocking to me. So certainly, I believe a focus on the educational system would be really important. Um, And I think also people need to be stronger in taking action at the state level and at the local level. You know, I read yesterday that Mayo Clinic, I think I'm pretty sure it was Mayo Clinic, just let go 700 workers because they refused to follow the vaccine mandate. Good. That's what needs to be done. I mean, the, these folks need to see the consequences because we're certainly all feeling it. Uh, so I think actions like that are important. Yeah, no, without question, there have to be consequences. That's why we're recording this in January and, and we just had Merrick Garland give his address saying that, you know, they're working on the investigations. They're going to go after everybody, no matter how powerful they may be. But how important do you think it is that we see high profile arrests, indictments of some of the, uh, of, of Trump himself, certainly, and his inner circle, like Bannon, who ran a war room in the Willard Hotel for the days leading up to the, you know, and promised on his podcast that all hell's gonna break loose on January 6th, it's go time. How important do you think that is for the, for the Department of Justice to, prosecute Trump and his inner circle for January 6th? 
Oh, I think it's really important. I think it's so important. And in part because of people like us and, you know, my 90 year old aunt who was just talking to me about this the other day and, and just your average decent citizen wants to see these consequences for what happened on January 6th, people who are absolutely appalled by that. And I think that it's important because so many people on the democratic side are feeling like nothing ever happens, nothing ever changes. Like, why hasn't this happened yet? It's already been a year. And then people get, you know, they they lose their sense of activism. And we need people to stay active in whatever way they can uh, to keep fighting this and fighting for our democracy, as they say. So I think if the Justice Department really did finally go ahead and arrest some people and prosecute some people, that would make a huge difference in the sentiment across the nation. Do you have any um, opinions on why hasn't anything significant happened after a year? Why haven't the DOJ or others uh, in Congress acted with urgency? I think the Democrats are too nice. (laughs) You know, they're always trying to make peace and go across the aisle and do all that. And um, even though I'm one who said, don't ever cut people off, I think, you know, when you're in government and you've got people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and some of those other, pardon my French assholes, you know, I think the Democrats need to take a stronger stance. They need to be strong and they need to exemplify that kind of strength so that the people in the country who don't want this going on can can really feel like it's worth fighting for because they've got leadership at the top that's fighting for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, On that note, you know, for what I could tell, you're wise enough to not spend all your days uh, lurking around Twitter. But unfortunately, Andrea and I are not so wise. And what we've seen a lot over the last four years is cults of personality forming around members of the DOJ or the FBI. Uh, you know, most notably with Robert Mueller, there were you know candles with him on it. There were uh, images of him as this strongman figure, and then the same applied to uh, Pelosi. And then now it's Merrick Garland. There is a cult. We're not sure how uh, authentic it is because there seems to be a lot of bots and automated aspects to it around Merrick Garland. And any criticism of him is met with just extreme condemnation. Like, how dare you not trust him? And and the rhetoric around it is so similar to QAnon. It's all, you know, trust the plan. It's coming. Just wait. It's this demand for loyalty. Like, Have you seen this yourself? And, you know, even if you haven't, like, what would possess people to behave this way? Well, I I haven't seen that. And I do spend a certain amount of time on on Twitter. (laughs) I guess I'm following the wrong people, but you're following the right people. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, that sounds horrendous. I mean, it's it's really using, you know, using the right wing playbook um, and using those, you know, sort of cult techniques of shutting down criticism um, and and any kind of challenge. So, yeah, I don't, I mean, I have no clue who's doing that. I don't know if you do, but it's definitely, I mean, maybe they think because the other side does it that way and it works, they should do it that way, but that's a bad strategy. It's a strange strategy because ostensibly it's coming from either Democrats or often from former members of the FBI or DOJ who say they want, you know, Trump and his, uh, you know, coterie of criminals to be held accountable. But then when when ordinary Americans demand for that to happen, you know, in a more um, fast moving timeline, because, of course, you know, we have the midterm elections coming and we have the statute of limitations uh, ending on a lot of Trump's earlier crimes. They are bombarded by a mob. Um, Yeah, maybe I'll send you some links. It's it's very strange. You know, there's this old book. I think we're going to have you on speed dial. Like we need a cold expert on speed dial at Gaslit Nation. There's a book, um, you know, from the 1970s that got banned when it first came out called The CIA and the Cult of Intelligence um, by, uh, who is it, Vincent Marchetti. Um, And I don't know if, do you know this book? Yeah, well, I knew it back in the day, but... What what do you think of it? I mean, just for our audience, he basically, uh, you know, this is a a former CIA official who called for 
uh, more transparency, and an end to what he thought of as a you know cultish secret secretiveness uh, in the government that was detrimental. And this was happening, you know, while the Watergate hearings were going on, uh, you know, after the Pike Committee and the Church Committee had emerged, the Pentagon Papers and so forth. This sort of time of accountability. Um, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? On like you know, quote unquote, cults of intelligence in the government. Well, you know, certainly there's a lot of, you know, there has been historically a lot of uh, secretive activity within the intelligence communities. I mean, you know, I guess the one that affected me most was COINTELPRO, mm -hmm. uh, which was infiltrating the left. But Right. And that that was, tar sorry, that was targeting especially uh, uh, Black communities. Yeah, Black Panthers and yeah, mm -hmm. the Black Liberation Movement. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, I think it's a sticky wicket. Um, I haven't been able to say that in a while. But. <laughs> <laughs> That's from your London interview last night. <laughs> um, because, you know, there was a time when I was doing a lot of discussions and presentations with various intelligence communities um, in the Five Eyes, which is, you know, the five countries who work together. When I actually got to meet these people who do this work, I really gained a lot of respect for them. So I think just as within probably any organization, there's going to be corruption, there's going to be secrets, there's going to be hidden things. I don't think that's what we most need to worry about right now. Maybe I'm being naive. I'll admit that. But I don't think that's our worry right now. No, we got, we've got plenty to... Uh to deal with. It's just, um, it, it's a strange manifestation, you know, because you obviously need agencies of accountability. You need agencies that do research on hostile threats to America. I think where it got, you know, uh, very complex and kind of unprecedented was the nature of uh, Trump's administration, you know, which was basically a crime syndicate masquerading as a government. And then you don't see those agencies stepping up to stop it. And they're very, very secretive about whatever it is they're doing to ostensibly stop it, which I think is why these cults around uh, you know, FBI officials or people like Mueller form, because people want so badly to believe that there's a savior in, you know, in the wait, that it's all just, you know, getting taken care of secretly and will eventually be, you know, uh relieved of this anxiety uh for our nation our nation's future. Um that unfortunately doesn't seem to be uh, in the cards, at least not in the uh, immediate moment. And if it is, I think they should tell us. But um, anyway, Andrea, I know you had more questions. Yeah, I feel like we're just so excited to talk to her that we're like, <laughs> could you tell us the the meaning of the universe, please? But um, so I think, you know, obviously we've seen from studying history that you have certain forces of personality, like you, Ulysses S. Grant is someone that I keep going back to. He just had the right character, the right personality to be a forceful general who, you know, I, I think arguably Lincoln, for instance, couldn't have had his cabinet, his, his team of rivals without having somebody that was just immensely forceful and ruthless and doing a lot of so-called dirty work by just crushing the enemy uh, wonderfully. Um, so I think when you're dealing with times of crises, you need bold leadership. You need people that need to ruthlessly uh, hunt down the enemy and crush the enemy. And we don't have that right now. On any, We have a Congress with full of many representatives who are speaking forcefully, but unfortunately they're hampered by um, party politics, the system itself with the rules um, viewed against them and so forth. But I think if, if a bold leader does emerge that is fearless and strong and, and strength and courage are contagious and says, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. We're going to get these laws done, these protections in place, these regulations, no matter what it takes, we're not going to go home until it's done. We just have not had that. We haven't had any coordinated, centralized leadership that's able to meet this moment right now. But I do think, and I always have faith in a lot of the men and women, including in law enforcement, including in intelligence, who are working tirelessly in the dark and, and are paying a great sacrifice and a great risk for that. And I do think that just like the enemy is increasingly decentralized, right? Because Trump's movement is going to survive Trump after he's gone. I think the resistance is also decentralized. Uh, prior to this conversation, I had a great conversation with uh, two experts at the States Project, which is a, a grassroots movement working to ensure um, 
state power, state um, offices are increasingly democratic um, so that good laws can be passed. And they're telling me about all these grassroots victories. It's the grassroots. So I think we do have a lot of hope in turning this around and meeting the moment. It's just a decentralized enemy currently is being met by a decentralized resistance because we're not getting the leadership we sorely need at the top. Um, It's been bottom-up power so far. I do want to ask you, people are increasingly demoralized, right, for a lot of reasons. It's not just the threat of fascism in America. It's very real. But also the climate crisis, of course. Also the algorithms. There was a leaked report out out of Facebook saying that Instagram deliberately makes young girls feel terrible about themselves and, and that what a mental health crisis that's contributing to. And um, they don't care. They, they want the engagement. They want the profit. So there's all, it's a time of um, many crises hitting us at once. And so during these times of great instability and uncertainty, uh, it seems that we might be entering a, or already in an age where people are more vulnerable to cults. Is that the case? Do you Do you expect to see more and more of the of, of cult like groups spring up and co- hardcore cults like are we ent- are we in danger of of an age of increasing cults yes absolutely i mean the when you know when societies are in crisis that's when cults do very well um you know we saw that when the soviet union crashed right and then every all the various cults ran over to Eastern Europe to recruit because here were people whose whole world was just turned upside down, right, in all these countries. So there's so much evidence of that happening. And and we see it in practically every little niche and venue. I mean, we've got the wellness industry, the sports industry, the those scents, (laughs) those um, oils that everybody gets, you know, and then it's in the business world and, you know, it's everywhere that these little grouplets grow and these leaders pop up and people are, are feeling vulnerable. They, you know, they don't know what the hell is happening in the world. And so they, you know, think, Oh, here's somebody who's, who sounds honest, who sounds like they have an answer and boom, there you go. So, yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more of this. What advice do you have for people in terms of where to start, where to take the first help step to like look for help? It depends on what stage somebody's at. If it's somebody who was in a cult and and has left a group and needs some support and help, it's really important to have some kind of social network that can support you. I work with two therapists who had experience in those awful boarding schools. Uh, So we all have cult experience in our background, and we've been doing courses on Zoom and um, also we do individual consultations. And so our, our website is um, tbylr.com, takebackyourliferecovery.com, but just the letters tbylr.com. So that's one place people can go. Um, there are some support groups around the country and online, and there are certainly books that are helpful to people and just finding, I know finding therapists, if that's what someone's looking for, is very difficult because a lot of therapists don't understand the effects of, of a cult membership or a cult involvement. And so it's important to find a therapist who understands what's called complex PTSD, not just PTSD. Um, there are resources out there, but people need to kind of dig around a bit. Um, and and there are certainly a lot of groups on the internet uh, where people discuss their experiences. You just need to be careful that you're not falling into something again where someone's going to take advantage of you. People are very vulnerable when they get out of cults. Well, thank you so much for your expertise. We're tremendously grateful for your time today and for enlightening us. And our, and I know our audience has been wanting this conversation for a while, so we appreciate it. Oh, great. Yes, thank yeah, you. This is great. You guys are, you guys are very smart. <laughs> very <laughs> thank very you. Knowledgeable. We yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. Our discussion continues and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the truth teller level or higher. We want to encourage you to donate to your local food bank, which is experiencing a spike in demand. We also encourage you to donate to Oil Change International, 
an advocacy group supported with a generous donation from the Greta Thunberg Foundation that exposes the true costs of fossil fuels and facilitates the ongoing transition to clean energy. We encourage you to help support Ukraine by donating to Razum for Ukraine at Razum, R-A-Z-O-M, for Ukraine.org. That's Razum for Ukraine.org. We also encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Ukraine, Syria, and Afghanistan. Donate at rescue.org. And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans, already under pressure from the palm oil industry, donate to the Orangutan Project at theorangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. Our production managers are Nicholas Torres and Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres, and our Patreon-exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Vissenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. Oh, and by the way, if you don't hear your name in this list and you've signed up, we're going to say your name starting in July and keep it going for however long you donated. FYI. <laughs> so we want to thank Eric Coffin. Jess Sauer. Chick Quinn. Lily Wachowski. Megan McNerney. Sean Rubin. Todd S. Perlstein. Pat. Kenny Main. John Schoenthaler. Frank Jaquette. Ellen McGurt. Joel Ferran. Larry Gasson. Erica Moore. Karen A. Deal. Nico Phillips. Brian E. Castor. Andrea or Andrea Scalzo. Tatiana Bursch. Karen Heisler. Jordan Sanders. Ann Bertino. Chris Bravo. T.R. Dunstan. John Millett. David East. Stu. Shannon Nacy. Ida. Chris Fellow. Ben Wheaton. Joseph Mara Jr. Rich Halcombe. Thomas Scheibe. Kelsey Malsom. Julie Matthews. Meganopolis. Mark Mark. Barbara Kittredge. Matthew Womack. Silas Frank. Sean Berg. Kristen Custer. Tracy Ash. Benjamin Galuza. Kai Gillis. Sharon Hattrick. Irv Robinson. William Barry Reeves. Richard Smith. Emmy. Kevin Gannon. Yvonne Q. Mike Christensen. Sandra Collins. Katie Masuris. John Laughlin. Jeff Thompson. James D. Leonard. Leo Chalupa. <laughs> Carol Golstad. Michael Woldridge. <laughs> Crimer, no criming. Jason Benke. Joe Darcy. Ann Marshall. Jeremy Lewis. Joel Newman. Trigve. Christine M. D.L. Singfield. Matt Perez. Nicole Spear. Brian Tajudin. Maureen Murphy. Michelle Dash. Abby Road. Jans Alstrup Rasmussen. Victoria Olson. Alabama. ZW. Lisa LaFlame. Jason Bainbridge. Sarah Gray. Mike Tripico. Diana Gallagher. Jennifer Ann Luter. John Ripley. Ethan Mann. Piet Yitzma. David Porter. Kate Cotton. Kim Mellon. Leah Campbell. Lynn Schneider. Jared Lombardo. Karen Humphreys. Eric Kaplan. Tanya Chalupa. Thank you all for your support. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. Thank you. Thank you.